from the headquarters of Telesio English in Quito, Ecuador. Welcome to this very special edition of From the South as the United States decides votes in midterm elections that could decide upon the presidency of Donald Trump. I'm Sweeney Gray. Massive turns out have been reported across the United States in the midterm elections, seen as a litmus test for President Donald Trump. These are the first national elections since Trump captured the White House in 2016, with his hardline policies and consistent attack on migrants. Today, the country is more divided than ever. At Scott all 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 35 seats in the 100 member Senate. 36 governor posts are also up for grabs along with seats in state legislatures across the country. Now, opinion polls favor Democrats to capture a majority in the House of Representatives, but they suggest that Republicans are likely to retain their majority in the Senate. This election is going to switch the Senate and the House seats. So if we can get a Democratic um, turnout, then we can help overrule some of the things that Donald Trump says and does. With all the uh, issues that are happening across the country, and the negative uh, energy coming out of Washington and this president. It's great to see someone like Beto who has great energy, great enthusiasm, positive, great message. So Adriano, why are these elections being seen as a referendum on Trump? I mean, the Trump and the Republicans and conservatives control all three branches of the government right now. So. Uh, people on the left are really responding to the last two years of his presidency, which have been, you know, absolutely terrible for the country on almost all fronts. So, um, you know, uh, the Democrats seem to like seem likely to win the House, not the Senate. But also on the ground, it seems like people are organizing um, in an effort to really challenge way beyond what the Democrats can do. So. Right. It's funny though, I remember us talking, obviously, off show um, a few weeks ago, and you were saying that the Democrats really should be in a much better position, considering how unpopular and problematic the president has been, and they're not. Why do you think that is? It's because the Democrats, for the last couple of decades, have ignored their base, and they've been focused on raising big money. And uh, when the elections come around, that's when they decide to focus on their base. When they want to court Latino voters, they court them on immigration issues instead of courting them on the fact that they're also working class people. And you can, you can talk to them about health care, you can talk to them about education, you can talk to them about all sorts of issues. So the Democrats have ignored their base, while the Republicans are doing a really good job with their base. I mean, and it's funny because it's like both parties are polar opposites in terms of how their ability to manage their base. So like the Democrats have ignored their base, but the Republicans, especially the president, seems to, has been criticized for only appealing to their base. And that has been one of the things that it hasn't seem, seemed to really hurt him yet in elections. Today might be a different, but you know, right, right. is there no middle ground in, in US politics where the base is concerned? It's, I mean, the thing is, the Republicans have their base, the Democrats have a base, but they're not tackling it. So there's, there's a Democratic base, but then there's also uh, a huge group of people who have been ignored of the left that are trying to challenge the Democratic Party to, to take a, a bolder stance, a more principled stance, instead of what the Democrats have been doing for decades now, which is uh, appealing and compromising to what the Republicans want in terms of policy, instead of staking a ground and saying, yeah, we stand for Medicare for all, or we stand for this, this, and that. Uh, instead, we get things like Obamacare, which, you know, have some nice things, right? You know, dependents up to the age of 26 years old, no, no pre-existing conditions, but they're still insurance companies, and it's wildly expensive for the average person and for the country itself, instead of saying, hey, well, we can, we can have a universal healthcare system like most of the richest countries in the world. All right, so we are talking about the U.S. midterm elections. So we're going to go to our correspondent in Washington, D.C., Aliana Ali Duterte, who brings us more about today's elections. The day of elections has so far been smooth, with no reported incidents. What has stood out is the high level of participation we've seen, including the nearly 35 million votes cast during early voting. 
Lines started forming before 7 a.m. outside polling stations across the country. According to reports, voter turnout has doubled in states like Georgia compared to the 2014 midterm elections. Polls in Indiana and Kentucky will be the first to close at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. One of today's most disputed races is for the governorship of Georgia, where Democrat Stacey Abrams has been making waves due to her progressive policies. She could become the first African-American woman governor in the country's history. Other races to look out for are in New Mexico, where Congresswoman Michelle Lujan Grisham could become the first Latina governor in the country. And in Texas, where former Dallas Sheriff Lupe Valdez could become the first gay Latina governor of a primarily Republican state. We thank Alina Duarte for that report. So Adriana, Alina's report was talking about the rise in diversity in the polls. So let's talk about that in the U.S. because racial politics, especially under this president, has become a hot button issue. So... Yeah, but but, I mean, but we're seeing different things. This isn't the first time that people of color or gay people or transgender people have been running for office. But what we're seeing now is that the, the, the left has been invigorated by the Bernie Sanders campaign and by the social movements that actually started under Obama, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, Transgender Rights Movement, the Dreamers Immigrants Rights Movement. And that has really fueled these campaigns to the point where we can probably see, you know, the first three black governors in the United States, the first Native American governor in the United States, the first Native American gov uh, representative in Congress, or the first openly gay uh, Latina governor. Like, this isn't the first time they're running. But are there are there popular are there possibility? Because, like you said, it's not the first time that um, they that persons. Of, of course, diverse of origins have gone up for the polls, but it's the first time they seem to have a real cha chance. Yeah. Is that a response to the president? It's a, it's a response to the president, but it's also the response to the fact that the left has been able to win electoral campaigns. Like we look at Ole Alexandra Ocasio Cortez, who won in June. It was a surprise thing, but why? Why did she win? She won because she went for that base. She did the hard work of actually organizing people, raising the money, knocking door to door, the real work that's required to actually win an election. Instead of what the Democrats have been doing for the last three years, which is 30, so let's, 30 years. Let's just, discuss that with our guest. So yeah. joining us now live from New York is the socialist activist Paul Heidemann. He's just published the book Class Struggle and the Color Line. Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Hey, Paul. So we wanted to talk about New York, where you're from, and the socialist candidate um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, correct? Right. Lovely. Yes. Where she could make a mark. Um, could you tell us how candidates like her have emerged so quickly and so strongly in this particular election? Yeah, well, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's uh, emergence really was fast. Um, you know, polling uh, back during the primary showed her down by, you know, double digits. Um, so very few people really expected her to win. Uh, but her uh, organizing that her campaign did on the ground took everyone by surprise and uh, showed that a very powerful incumbent Democrat could be overtaken by uh, a progressive insurgent um, with that kind of organizing gain. Um, and, and so that has kind of changed the game, I think, for uh, progressive uh, socialist candidates across the country. And now there are uh, I think a whole lot of people looking to follow, for example. So if someone like Alexandra, and we were talking, Alec, um, Adriano and I were talking earlier about the amount of diverse candidates who, not so much that they're running, but they have a real chance in this election. Why do you think that is? What, what is it about this midterm election that makes their candidacy so viable? Well, I think there's a few things. I think, um, you know, there's things like the Me Too movement, for example, um, which has put the spotlight on uh, women's resistance to sexual violence and I think has energized campaigns for, for women candidates all over the country. Um, there's, of course, Trump's uh, the, the massive amount of racism coming from Trump's GOP, which has uh, certain people of color and to run and uh, to try and lead the fight against that. And then I think there's you know, the, the, the broader social firm coming out of movements like that have uh, challenged standing patterns of racial oppression in this country. Um, and I think all of them to um, uh, a number of people are the primary of challenge facets of injustice. 
And um, more importantly, what kind of impact do you think the do you think these candidates have a real chance in this election? And what sort of impact do you think they will have if they do win their seats, their respective seats? There's a, a number of candidates, but very progressive candidates who are going to win. So, uh, Casio Cortez will certainly win tonight. Uh, so will Rashida Tlaib in uh, Michigan, who's a, a Muslim American woman and a Democrat. Um, uh, both of them kind of surprising uh, to win their primary. Um, and I think tonight that's going to be a real time for some candidates. And that's in California. Is running for the fifth Buffy Wicks, who ran Clinton's campaign in the state. And this is a campaign where the progressive, where the kind of established exactly what's the thrown throwing everything they can to keep her. And so the result tonight will you know whether uh, these kind of progressive insurgents can win the terrain uh, isn't the warfare that uh, Hez was able to practice, and is uh, a more traditional uh, hard fought battle. Uh, Thank you so much, Paul Heidemann, for chatting with us. We've been chatting with Paul Heidemann. He's the author of Class Struggle and the Color Line. Adriano, so we've been talking about today's elections and the fact that the Democrats have a real chance. Um, Trump is known as the first celebrity president. Sure, yeah. So how, how has celebrity affected, you think, this um, his tenure and his ability to be so Blunt. unfiltered, <laughs> <laughs> unfiltered um, as a president yeah. and get away with it. And do the Democrats have a celebrity, have, have any strategy, strategy that can counteract his, cele his celebrity? I mean, I think, I think his celebrity helps him because there was this opening for this sort of populism, right? And what he does is he brings this outsider perspective, even though he's a billionaire and dines with the Hillary Clintons and the George Bushes of the world, right? So I think that populism has played into the fact that the dead-end status quo politics had, weren't going anywhere, and, and he's also riled up a base of just racists, and you have to be honest about that. Um, do the Democrats have something to sort of challenge that? I mean, in terms of celebrities, no, but um, you know, they're trying. And I think they're failing. And I think the insurgents in their party are sort of reawakening the base and also reawakening the party to wake up and take notice of the fact that they, they could easily start losing some important positions because they're not paying attention to what people want. Okay, thank you so much, Adriano, for that. Now, our correspondent, Jorge Hestoso, is in Washington. And with him is Alma Cuverte. She's the Deputy Director for Immigration at the Center for Community Change. Hello, Jorge. Thank you so much for joining us. President Trump has clearly tried hard to make migration a central issue in these elections. How much impact has that had? Okay, so we had Jorge up on the screen. Hello, Jorge. Are you hearing me? Do you need me to repeat my question? And to help us to put in perspective these midterm elections, uh, we have the honor to have with us uh, Gracie Lima. She's a political director with the Center for Community Change Action. Grecia, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Grecia, we have heard some exit polls showing that the popularity of uh, President Trump, we're talking about an approval rate of 45% and disapproval of 55%. Is that sort of uh, range could play a role in what we can expect tonight? You know, what I'm really excited about is that I have witnessed so many people excited to vote and to cast their ballot in this election se season. I think that most of them, or a good majority of them, are doing it because they're tired of the division that this administration has put forward. And we're talking about precisely the record number of votes that they did it uh, ahead, early voting and even absentee voting. We're talking over 38 million Americans were doing the voting before today. That's right. And in many cases, we're talking about young voters and also first-time voters. Is that could play a role in the polls that they were showing ahead of time? Absolutely. Most political campaigns have a formula of what they call the win number. 
Uh, the win number is usually calculated based on the likely, likely uh, voters. This time we're seeing record number of young people, of Latina women like me, that are voting for the first time. And that's going to mess up a lot of the formulas and expectations that people are having for tonight. We're talking also that, uh, talking about women. Record number of women participating as candidates, over 270. And we're talking a key vote. We're talking white, suburban women, well-educated, that we've known that they have voted for Trump before. And now, what could happen? Yeah, there's those women. There's also African-American women that are witnessing women, other women run, like Stacey Abrams in Georgia, that is exciting a whole new wave of women that are participating, Latina, African-American women that are voting for the first time, some of them that even missed the 2016 election, that now feel energized because of other women that are running in the ticket that are inspiring them to participate and vote for the first time. They're voting for local elections, for Senate, for, I mean, one-third of the Senate, and we're talking about the, for the full House, but we're talking about also 35, 36 governmental uh, elections, and that is pretty important because sometimes they're changing the laws of immigration through local governments like in, in Arizona and in Texas. Mm -hmm. So much of the um, policies that impact people directly, like Medicaid and expansion, like um, you know the police and what um, what constitutes uh, legal and not legal in the states, is actually done through the state governors. So we could witness a huge movement for new governors that used to be Republican governors that now are going to be not just Democrats, but very progressive Democrat voters. So now we're going to jump in speculation. Okay. What if the Democrats have a good night and they say that that blue wave was really uh, materializing? What could be, if that will be the scenario, the next two years of the presidency of Trump? How that could affect? Yeah, I think that all of it is between the action and the reaction, right? Um, the president, it's unlikely that he will change his tone or his policies. I don't have faith that that's what's going to happen. But what we could expect is that now a whole new electorate that voted for the first time is now also going to be inspired and energized to continue to move the fight. And like we just mentioned, the governor's races and the state legislatures are going to be going into effect starting on January. So there will be a lot of opportunity to actually pass policies at the state level that will benefit a lot of our families and our communities. The other side of the coin, what if the blue wave founds a red wall, not with Mexico <laughs> yet, <laughs> a red wall, and in that case, the, what for many, many experts is we're witnessing that we're talking about uh, extreme rights, uh, white supremacy, xenophobia, racism. Uh, could that be the continuation of that trend or even worsening that trend for the next two years? Um, it's a s very scary scenario to think that we could end up with um, those type of elected officials. But I believe that um, our communities are going to do what they do best, which is survive and fight back. And it's not going to be an EC process, especially if we end up with elected officials that support that type of administration and that type of rhetoric. But um, yeah, I would say that we would be in a very, very dark scenario. We're talking that uh, polls are closing in some cases at uh, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, for example, in Virginia, here in uh, D.C. and in neighboring uh, Maryland at 8 o'clock. So by the end of the day, can we have, can we can expect a sort of a clear picture of what's going to be the results? For your sake and my sake, I hope so. <laughs> um, but really, um, it, it's going to, I think what we could see is that there's going to be some states that make some early calls, and there's going to be a couple other states, like Florida, like Georgia, that have been very, very close for a couple months, that they might take a little while, and we might be into late hours of the night, understanding um, what what are the counties and how are they voting. Grecia, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We're talking with Grecia Lima. She is the political director with the Center for Community Change Action. 
trying to put in perspective the results of these historical midterm elections. We get back to you in studios. Thank you so much for that interview, Jorge Hestoso. So we're going to take a short break now and we'll say goodbye to Adriano. Um, but stay with us because we have more news after this. Welcome back. Elections are also taking place in the Caribbean, Grenada, as well as Antigua and Barbuda, are voting in referendums to decide if the Caribbean Court of Justice should be their final appeal court instead of the Privy Council based in the UK. There has been a low voter turnout in Antigua and Barbuda so far. Some say they were not aware of the voting schedule. Now, experts have argued that the Privy Council is the last vestige of colonialism in the region and as such should be removed. Oh, okay. Now, turning to Grenada on Monday, Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell addressed misinformation being spread online about Tuesday's referendum in an address to the nation. He told citizens not to take notice of inaccurate information being shared, arguing that it was easier for Grenadians to access justice via the CCJ, which is based in Trinidad, as opposed to the Privy Council, which is based in London. The irrefutable fact is that the only real issue on the ballot for Tuesday is whether to keep the Privy Council, which a vast majority of our people don't have the money to access, or to vote for the Caribbean Court of Justice, which will make our final justice less costly and more accessible to all people. So to discuss how voting went in Grenada, we are being joined live by the CCJ Advisory Committee member and attorney, Ruggles Ferguson. Hello, Ruggles. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good evening, and good evening to all listeners and viewers. Greetings from Grenada. <laughs> um, so how was voting today? Has turnout been high, or have people been staying away? No, very low voter turnout. In fact, based on the final figures that I'm seeing, you had a voter turnout of just about 22,000 out of a voting list of over 7,000. So it was a very low turnout. Uh, in fact, uh, probably as low as the last referendum in 2016. And in Grenada, the results are already out. Um, uh, have out of the total voters. The no votes have failed. Uh, have 12,100 voters who voted no and 9,840. So, Ruggles, does this mean... So, you had a low voter turnout. Does that, does that affect the validity of the referendum results at all? Can it still be adhered to? Uh, no, it does not affect it at all. Yes, uh, that's the final result. Actually, succeed to make the CCJ our final appellate court. We require third of those voting, the valid vote cast referendum. So for the bill, it required not only a simple majority, but two-thirds of those voting. In fact, it's a very high, a very high level. And uh, uh, as you see from the final result, um, uh, this day, yes, vote did not get even a simple majority. So uh, those are the final results. I'm not too sure about the results in Antigua. Um, but what we do know is one, low voter turnout, and two, that the no vote uh, prevailed. The no vote prevailed in Antigua? No, we know that no vote prevailed in Grenada. I'm not sure about the Antigua results. So how do you feel about the results? Because I know you're very much um, a supporter of the CCJ being the final appellate court in Grenada in particular. Right. Well, disappointed with the final result, but of course, it's the will of the people, and the will of the people must be respected. 
um, unfortunately, um, over the last week, and uh, in particular uh, over the last seven weeks, um, uh, took a very political um, turn in that the opposition came out openly and say, vote no. Uh, so here yeah, you had the ruling party encouraging people to vote yes, and the ruling party saying vote no. And in order to have a two-thirds majority, you need a consensus between government, opposition, civil society organization. And uh, uh, we going into a referendum with one side saying yes and one side saying no. It's almost impossible to achieve a two-thirds majority, especially in the context of an issue that is not an exciting issue. So, uh, Ruggles, really quickly, if you all had to do, if you all had to go to another referendum, how, what is the timeline for something like that? And what would the CCJ Advisory Committee do differently to try and get um, a different vote, a different result? Well, first and foremost, you must try to achieve consensus. Secondly, uh, you need to uh, reach out to the people throughout the length and breadth of the country, in the communities, in the workplaces, and all I call, I call sessions. Um, one of the criticisms uh, about this process was that the bill not sufficient to discuss. In other words, you had to pose a fund of the versus the Privy Council. But uh, over the last month, many people began to raise issues about the bill. And uh, uh, whether or not they were justifiable is not important. The fact is, it led to the confusion among persons out there. So, for example, uh, the opposition was saying, yes, TCG, but no to a bad bill. And they contended that the bill was bad. You had it two days ago. Um, in, so on social media, you had popular petitions in advance that the bill was not clear about the CCJ. But if you voted yes to the law government to amend the constitution, in fact, the seven that failed in the last referendum in 2016, I voted yes to the law of the government to return all those bills. So you had a lot of petition um, out there. Uh, but in achieving uh, a successful result, especially when it's third, it's really trying to get as much consensus as possible, as difficult as it is, and secondly, uh, um, to really map out on public education throughout the community and the world. Thank and you so much for that, Ruggles. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but I really appreciate your um, insight and actually live update for us because we hadn't heard what the actual final results were. So we appreciate chatting with you. We've been speaking to Ruggles Ferguson. He's a member of the CCJ Advisory Committee from Grenada, and we've come to the end of this news brief. So for these and many other stories, you can find them on our website at tellusyourenglish.net. And join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But tell us your English. I am Sony Gray. Thank you for watching.